Is philosophy useless? It's a good question, and one that deserves a thoughtful answer. In this video, I'm going to explain why philosophy has quite significant and wide-ranging utility. But before getting to that, I want to note that regardless of whether philosophy is practically useful, I don't think the merits of a discipline or activity are determined by practical utility. Art, after all, isn't super practically useful, but it's a valuable expression of human creativity, ingenuity, insight, and experience. Likewise, even if philosophy isn't practically useful, in my view it's intrinsically valuable. Exploring the fundamental nature of reality with care, caution, rigor, and a love for truth just strikes me as deeply valuable in and of itself, whether or not it accrues practical benefits. But because this may not be convincing for those with a more practically oriented mindset, and because it really is true that philosophy has lots of practical payoffs, I'm going to set aside the point about intrinsic value and focus on philosophy's utility in today's video. So then, here's why philosophy isn't useless. Oh, and I'm drawing here from a video I made on common internet mistakes in philosophy and religion. Alright, mistake number 54, philosophy is useless. So, first up, suppose that that's true. It's not, as I'm about to explain, but suppose that that's true. So what? Right? If you want to draw any normative or epistemological conclusion from that, such as that we should therefore stop doing it, or stop teaching it, or that it cannot produce any knowledge, well then congratulations, right? you're doing philosophy. If, for instance, you think philosophy cannot produce any knowledge, then your philosophical reasoning here cannot produce any knowledge, and your argument subverts itself. But in any case, it isn't true that philosophy is useless, and only those uninformed about its goings-on would make such a statement. There are, for starters, lots of personal intellectual benefits that philosophy cultivates. Critical thinking skills, better abilities to detect bullshit, analytical writing and reading, parsing difficult texts, formulating and assessing the reasoning contained in arguments, seeing whether people's conclusions actually follow from their premises, pinpointing underlying or implicit assumptions, making distinctions that clarify and precisify debates, and so on down the list. All of this translates nicely into various practical benefits, such as scoring very well on the LSAT, GRE, and things like that. And in fact, philosophy majors perform substantially better than average for each of these standard tests for admission to graduate school, and not a single other group of majors shows such consistent high level of achievement. This indicates a high level of general skills sought after by employers too, right? The ability to think rigorously, express oneself clearly, analyze situations and arguments, and come up with creative solutions to problems, and being able to map out those solutions and their pros and cons. Philosophy also helps us better inform our moral and political views, which in turn helps us live better lives. For instance, by helping us decipher whether it's moral or immoral to eat meat, to refrain from donating most of our income to charity, to lock people up in prison, to have an abortion, to uphold a system of private ownership of the means of production, and so on down the list. Philosophy as a discipline also has various benefits. And here we're going to listen to some portions of Graham Priest's talk on the nature of philosophy and his place in the university. There are two very important aspects of philosophy that Passmore's account throws into prominence. The first is that philosophy is essentially critical. And this is the first point I'm going to flag. This is one of the things that distinguishes philosophy from religion, politics, and normal science in the sense of uh, Tom Kuhn, the historian of science. Nothing is sacrosanct. Everything is fair game for challenge. It must defend itself or go under. The second aspect that Hasmore's account throws into prominence is that philosophy has a symbiotic relationship with other disciplines. It draws many of its central issues from other areas, such as physics, psychology, law, literature, and so on. And in return, it provides for them a critique of their methods, canons of argument, and fundamental beliefs which spur on the long-term development of those subjects. But despite these things, I think that Passmore, Passmore's account is wrong. It takes account of what we might call the analytic side of philosophy, that is, its critical and evaluative aspects, but it ignores what we might call the synthetic side, because philosophy is also a strongly imaginative and creative subject, and this is the second point that I flag. Philosophers have produced some of the most ingenious, and important theories in Western thought. Sometimes the theories become, deservedly or undeservedly, mere history. More importantly, sometimes the theories are taken up by later disciplines to provide bases for important developments. Thus, in science, atomism and positivism. Positivism played an important role in both the special theory of relativity and psychological behaviorism. Both these things, uh, atomism and 
positivism, to name just a couple from a long list, were first thought of by philosophers. In politics, the ideas of Hobbes, Locke, and Marx have all been made the bases of political systems. In art, the Romantic movement of the 19th century owed much to the Romantic philosophy of Rousseau, Coleridge, and others. And so it goes on. Indeed, as Passmore himself said in a recent interview in the Bulletin, uh, and I quote, almost all the ideas which we now take for granted came from philosophy. To understand the other illuminating but incorrect account of philosophy that I want to talk about, it is necessary to look at the historical development of Western thought. It's a striking fact that philosophy is the area out of which nearly all other more specialised intellectual inquiries that we now recognise sprang, and this is the third point that I flag. They each broke away from philosophy when they developed specialised methods appropriate to dealing with the objects of their inquiry. Mathematics was the first to break away in about the 3rd century BC. Pythagoras was as much philosopher as mathematician. Euclid was not. Astronomy broke away about the 2nd century AD with Ptolemy. Physics and the other natural sciences broke away in the early 17th century at the times of Galileo and Descartes. And sociology, psychology, economics and so on broke away in the 19th century. And so it went. We are currently witnessing philosophy give birth to literary theory. And what subjects will follow is anyone's guess. It's interesting to note that logic, which could have broken away at any time after the 3rd century BC, has retained its central locus in philosophy, despite its forging alliances with other disciplines. The fact that philosophy has given birth to most other theoretical inquiries cannot provide the basis of a definition of philosophy. It's a fact that it itself cries out for explanation, presumably in terms of the nature of philosophy. So far, then, in the search for a definition of philosophy, we've drawn a blank. We've already seen enough, however, for me to take up the secondary theme of this lecture, the role of the philosophy, the role of philosophy in a university, to which I now turn. Universities have three prime functions and, correlatively, three prime responsibilities. And I shall argue that philosophy is important, indeed essential, to each of these. The first is research. The first function of a university is to research and the correlative responsibility is to the subject researched. There's no older academic discipline than philosophy. This has always been a prime area of research in universities. Moreover, it's important to remember that universities now bear the sole responsibility for research in philosophy. Gone are the days when either the church or private incomes provided for the livelihood of philosophers. If the universities of the world closed their philosophy departments, philosophy wouldn't cease. The fascination of the human mind for some of the most profound problems that can be posed will ever outstrip local institutional arrangements. However, organised research in philosophy would cease. For this reason, if no other, universities have a responsibility to ensure the existence of thriving philosophy departments. However, the importance of research in philosophy far outstrips its own local confines. As I pointed out, historically, Philosophy has functioned as the mother of theoretical inquiries, giving birth to them all. If we wish new areas or disciplines to emerge, and there is no reason to smugly assume that all that there can be already are, research in philosophy is essential to provide the matrix out of which they may arise. Secondly, and as I've already noted, research in special areas, once they have evolved, does not decouple itself from philosophy. Fundamental problems are thrown back to philosophy for analysis, and philosophers are in the ideal position to perform this service. First, because of their training and critical scrutiny. Secondly, because they're willing to question things which practitioners of the special areas are not themselves prepared to question at that time. And third, because they're prepared to suggest fruitful, speculative ideas that someone deeply ingrained in the subject is unlikely to countenance. The historian of science, Tom Kuhn, I've already mentioned, in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, observed that philosophy has played an important role in all revolutions in the natural sciences. His point would have been equally valid for revolutions in psychology, politics, or whatnot. The second function of a university is to teach, and the correlative responsibility is to its students. In one respect, this is but a corollary of the previous function. You can't have research in a subject unless you train researchers. However, few people who are undergraduates at this university or any other will become researchers. What then are they doing here? Part of the answer is that they're here to absorb a body of information. 
which they'll go then out into the wider world and apply. But there's only a part of the story, however, and a smaller part than many would think. If this were all there were to teaching, there would be a much more cost-effective way of going about it. We could just create a battery hen university. The rest of the story is that universities should produce thoughtful, mature, rational, well-rounded people who are capable of living their lives to the full and enriching those of others. If someone can leave a university without having had the opportunity to think about the existence of God, various moral problems, such as abortion, the rights and wrongs of the political system in which they live, the nature of the physical universe in which they live, in short, in philosophy, then that university has failed its students. In an ideal world, all students would, perhaps, take courses which require them to think about these issues. However, this is not an ideal world, as I need hardly remind you. Time is a scarce commodity, but even in a less than ideal world, students may attend open discussions, seminars, debates on these issues, provided only that they are available. And they should be available in any university worth its salt. There was a debate in the uh, correspondence columns of the Australian about six months ago on whether the new universities being renamed in Australia are real universities. And the centre of the debate seemed to have become whether or not they could be real universities without any philosophical presence. And there was uh, a letter from one of the heads of these institutions, whom I now forget, who pointed out that real universities didn't need to have a philosophical presence because there were some quite bona fide universities which didn't have a philosophical presence. For example, there was the um, University of Padua in the uh, 12th century. <laughs> Point made. Thus, philosophy should play an integral role in both the formal and the informal educational life of a university. The third function of a university is to be the locus of certain social resources. And the correlative responsibility is to society. In a sense, this too is a corollary of the previous point. As I said then, it is a function of a university to produce people who can enrich the lives of others, and doing so is precisely fulfilling one's responsibilities to society. This is done in many ways, and I attempt no exhaustive list. But first, People at universities are able to help others appreciate their cultural heritage, be this philosophy, literature, or science. Secondly, they can actually create this cultural heritage. Amongst the humanities, philosophy is quite unique in this respect. Writers are rarely to be found in English departments. Few people in music departments are composers. But with few exceptions, creative philosophers are found in and only in university philosophy departments. Next, people at universities have an important role to play in social commentary and criticism, be this through the media, government commissions, moves for social and legal reform, and so on. Now, philosophers have an important role to play in these things, for usually they've thought about the issues professionally and, just as importantly, have no special interests to protect. Moreover, they're good social critics for exactly the same reasons that they're good critics in general. They have both highly developed critical skills and are prepared to float novel ideas. Of course, this may make them unpopular sometimes. I've yet to see a government that welcomed criticism. Which is why the independence of the universities from outside power groups, most notably the government, is absolutely crucial to fulfilling this social role. Okay, getting back to our script, it's well known that philosophy has given birth to lots of other fields once we reached consensus on the relevant methods for investigating the relevant domain. Significant parts of what we now call science was once natural philosophy. Economics, psychology, computer science, and boatloads of other fields branched off from philosophy relatively recently, in fact. For instance, the theoretical basis for computing was worked out by logicians, such as Gödel and Church, before the first electronic computer was even thought of. There's also tons of interdisciplinary work happening right now between philosophers, scientists, engineers, and many others as regards AI, between philosophers of physics and physicists about the foundations of quantum mechanics and relativity. For instance, there's tons of collaboration between physicists and philosophers of physics like David Albert, Barry Lower, and lots of others. Philosophers play integral roles in lots of interdisciplinary scientific research. The Free Will Show, in fact, had a whole season of their excellent podcast dedicated to free will and science, and they brought on lots of scientists and philosophers talking about their joint work on scientific research on free will, and how philosophers have played a key role in this scientific research. Philosophers play integral roles in lots of psychological research, too, such as working closely with famous psychologists Paul Bloom, David Pizarro, and so many more. 
Also, philosophy is pretty important for science, in particular, not only for lots of the reasons previously mentioned, right? I mean, like it helps significantly in assessing any argument, whether inside or outside science. It helps in pinpointing any implicit assumptions in lines of reasoning, etc. It helps to very clearly and precisely articulate distinctions that are used within scientific debates, as well as that are used within, for instance, survey research. But also philosophy is pretty important for science because values play a huge role in science. And philosophy, specifically ethics, is needed to examine these evaluative questions. Right? For more on values in science, I recommend checking out Kane B's excellent video on values in science. There are evaluative questions relating to scientific funding, to the applications of scientific findings, to scientific experimentation, for instance, the extent of permissible experimentation on humans, non-human animals, etc., and so much more. Like, there are various evaluative questions pertaining to what should we fund? There's a reason there are philosophers on ethics review boards for scientific experiments. To properly engage all these evaluative questions in science, we need good ethical reasoning. In other words, we need good philosophy, as ethics is a subfield of philosophy. Another thing Priest doesn't mention is that philosophy is needed if only because there's lots of bad reasoning and mistaken philosophy out there, which needs good philosophy to serve as a corrective. If you think, for instance, that advancing transgender rights, expanding access to gender-affirming healthcare, etc. is a good thing, then you'll need good philosophy to address those who raise philosophical objections to your pro-transgender stances, such as objections based on the alleged nature of gender, sex, identity, social construction, and whatnot. Similarly, if you think advancing transgender rights, expanding access to gender-affirming healthcare, etc. is a bad thing, then you'll need good philosophy to address those who raise philosophical objections to your anti-transgender stances, such as objections based, again, on the alleged nature of gender, sex, identity, social construction, and whatnot. So, in summary, even if we suppose that philosophy is useless, people are generally going to be using philosophy to draw conclusions on the basis of that, and so they're kind of subverting their own argument, that's what they're going to be tending to do. But in any case, it's simply false that philosophy is useless. There are tons of personal intellectual benefits that it cultivates in terms of reasoning and critical thinking skills, analytical reading and writing, and in general, just gaining lots of transferable skills, scoring well on the LSAT and GRE and so on. There are benefits in terms of informing our moral and political views, which help us live better lives. Philosophy has been integral in giving birth to lots of other disciplines like computer science, psychology, economics, science itself. Philosophy and philosophers play key roles in lots of interdisciplinary work with regard to AI, the foundations of quantum mechanics and relativity, empirical research on free will, empirical research on cognition, moral judgment, moral psychology. Yet another reason philosophy is important for science is because values play a huge role in science with respect to what should get funding, with respect to how we should apply certain scientific findings, with respect to permissible scientific experimentation, and so on. These are all ethical questions which fall under the banner of philosophy. And finally, philosophy is needed if only because there's tons of bad reasoning and mistaken philosophy out there. Oh, and also, it's just pretty fun. And fun things are fun, aren't they? Well, I mean, well, you're going to say, like, soccer is useless. And, like, okay, I mean, like, even supposing that it is, it's fun. I'm going to do it. I don't care if it doesn't really serve a practical use. And perhaps being fun is itself a kind of utility. Likewise, at least for me, I find Flossy fun. And if you're watching this, you probably do too. And if not, I hope the wonders of the majesty of reason can help you at least find some fun in it. And finally, on this point about philosophy's utility, I highly recommend Friction Philosophy's video, What is the Value of Philosophy? It's basically like an interview supercut with tons of different philosophers just kind of off the cuff, giving what they think is the value of philosophy. They, they raise tons of considerations that I don't even raise in here. I also recommend Bertrand Russell's lecture on the value of philosophy and Graham Priest's full lecture on the nature of philosophy and its role in the university, clips of which I played earlier. All of these can be found in my Doing Philosophy playlist. All right, and that's all she wrote for part one of this seven-part series on common mistakes that people make in the philosophy and religion sphere. Thank you all for tuning in. Stay tuned for parts two through seven. And I'm also going to be making some clips with respect to individual mistakes that I think are particularly problematic and particularly interesting. So you're going to get lots of fun, majesty of reason content out of all this. As always, if you enjoyed the video, please smash that like button. That really does help put the video out there. Drop your thoughts down below in the comment section. I'd love to hear them. Turn on that little bell so you get notified when these videos come out. If you like, please consider supporting me on Patreon or making a one-time donation. And finally, what better way to end is there than I'm Joe Schmidt. This is The Majesty of Reason, and peace out.